My son was 18 months. I noticed he was delayed. And I was, that, that first year, I was upset. I was angry. I was in denial. All the things that you can possibly think of. And after I got over that phase, I'm like, hey, I need some answers. I need something I can do to make it easier on myself, find resources. And I started sharing with Sharon because I was looking for resources and they were limited. I was looking for like that group of people who knew exactly what I was going through, but that was also limited. So I started sharing with Sharon. So of course I can share information. It was just a mother trying to share information, share what she knew, share what she found out in my process while I was navigating um, being an autism mom. Because you can work and do something for years, but once it's in your home, it's completely different. So sharing with sharing is to bring clarity and understanding to all things autism. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it because uh, with with my two boys, I have three. Um, our nine-year-old, he was diagnosed with ADHD. And we just found this out maybe about almost a year ago. And so we kind of struggle with that. And even for myself personally, my wife is a nurse and she works with special needs kids. But for me, it took a while uh, to uh, come to the reality of it that you know, my my boys actually have autism because our youngest, he have delayed speech as well. Uh, why do you believe, do you think most men or most dads maybe struggle with going through the process of actually having the child, your child diagnosed? Like, do you think men struggle with that? I think they definitely struggle with it. Yeah. And um, based off my studies and what I've learned, um, for every six boys, there's only one girl. So imagine if your little boy who you expect to play football, running, tackling, basketball, sports, you know what men think. We um, Men are like dominant. They're the ones who are in control. And to know that they don't have that control or their son's not looking at them and their son's not following their direction or copying what they do, because that's typical. A typical child will follow what their fathers do. And being is mostly boys that we see being diagnosed, the father can't take that. It's really harder on a man being that is mostly boys and they, don't, they can't see their son following in their footsteps or you can't see it in the in the midst of the diagnosis, in the midst of the delayed speech, in the midst of the misinterpretation of what they they may hear. You may be saying, let's go. They may be going in the opposite direction. So the fathers, it, I think, I believe, it's just harder to, you know, take in and accept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's tough because I know a, a, a male friend of mine's and his son, I believe, because now that I've I've been around around it for a little while, I can kind of pick up on some things. I can see that his child is is autistic, but he having he he didn't come to the realization of it yet. Like, oh no, he's good. And I was like, okay, you know, what can you say? Uh, I do believe that early intervention is is very important, and I want to talk about that later as well but what were some of the biggest challenges you faced early in the early years of parenting uh your child with autism because you have two so does just one have autism or or both yeah my son has autism he's four years old my daughter's three she doesn't have autism mm -hmm. um of course they were definitely watching her trying to make sure she was meeting her milestones and which she did but for me, early on, I knew, of course, I was in the field. I've been a teacher's aide. I've been a unique aide. I've worked in the autism um, classrooms, just, you know, being aides until I finished with college and became the actual teacher. My goal initially wasn't to be a teacher for ASD kids. I just fell in love with ASD kids. So me, I'm going to work to see these kids work with them and for me, my biggest challenges were accepting my son. I'm like, no, this can't be happening to me. Mm -hmm. He's my first child. I mean, like, I wanted a baby. I really want, like, I didn't want problems. And I think a lot of parents deal with that because we we have so many things that we pre-plan. I'm a pre-planner. I plan out things that I want and how he's going to, you know, do these certain sports. 
So it was like, okay, he's six months. He's not babbling. He's not making sounds. He's mute. He's He prefers to look at letters than actual pictures. I'm like, okay, this doesn't make sense. And then at one, he still wasn't walking, still wasn't talking. Um, his cousins, you know, family, friends, they're like kids that are six and seven months crawling and doing way more than my son. So I started to get, um, honestly, I started to get embarrassed. I was shame. I was like, what did I do wrong? I started to self doubt. I started to feel guilt. Like, what did I do wrong? What did I not eat? Was I eating healthy? Was I eating, you know, too many sweets? It was just so many things that were running through my mind. So I didn't want to say anything. I told his dad, his dad did the denial thing. No, 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 no. His dad was very defensive. Like, no. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And then I had to come, you know, face it. He is autistic. And I knew it prior to us even getting the eval done because he was delayed. He wasn't talking. He was a picky eater. He was stem, like spin around in a circle, but while he's sitting down or shake his head back and forth. So I knew all the st stemming, you know, protocol. I knew all the things that he was displaying. I just wasn't ready. And his father obviously wasn't ready. So that didn't help at all. And um, my friends, their kids wasn't doing it. My associates, my family members, their kids wasn't doing it. I've never saw it at home or in my family. So for me, it was like, and I never saw a kid that age. See, I'm working in an elementary school setting, not in a toddler preschool setting or an infant setting. So for me, it was just accepting the diagnosis and moving forward with getting the help that I needed, which I was very hesitant to do. Mm -hmm. I understood it. Understood. Uh, what are some self-care strategies that have been most effective for you as a parent of a child with autism? Self-care for me. Yes. Wow, I've never gotten that question. Mm -hmm. And I've done multiple interviews, so I absolutely love it. Um, self-care strategies for me, mm -hmm. I get away. I get away. So like I would literally take a 24 hour trip somewhere <laughs> else, Arizona, I mean, Colorado, I'm in Florida. So I would just, you know, um, pen and pad. I'll, I'll travel. I'll do something, you know, like take a quick flight, be alone, or I'll just pen and pad. I'm a journal. I'm a journaler. I will write my feelings, my emotions, what I'm thinking. And I think for parents um, or family members who's dealing with that diagnosis, any kid on the spectrum, journaling has always helped me because no one can know how you feel. You know how you feel. God knows how you feel. And you can say any and everything that you're feeling at the moment. That's definitely self-care. And of course, I'm a woman. So like hair, nails, makeup, trying to like beautify myself is also a self-care strategy that I try to do quite, you know, like once or twice a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's good. Um, so I want to ask uh, this question. So uh, what's your current relationship status, if you don't mind me asking? I'm a single mom. OK, single mom. So how how do you go about dating uh, and, and having a child with autism? Like how do, how does that work for you? Do you find it difficult do you find people more like more accepting or more willing to come beside you and aid aid you? How like what does that look like for you? Um, that's so well, that's a great question. Um, I haven't been single for a very long time, <laughs> less than a year. So I haven't really been dating. I mean, I've communicated with people, talked on the phone, went out to dinner dates, and I'll tell them about, but I'll tell them about, you know, my organization. They probably know that I live, sleep, eat autism because that's what I do for a living also. So I think it's more so a sympathy or empathy type of thing. Like, wow, because when you think of autism, you think of they feel sorry for you. Because when you think of autism, you think of a biter, a spitter, a stretcher. Mm -hmm. So I think in the dating world, that male or that female, for me, I think men are going to feel um, some type of empathy or sympathy for me. They're going to feel sorry for me because not only am I doing it at home alone, I'm doing it with no 
with no um companion right there next to me, you know, because for some in the in the past, I would say, hey, I need to take some time to myself. I go in another room, I leave the house, he's with his father. Now it's you have to stick it out, Sharon. You have to be here, Sharon. You have to stay present, Sharon. So that's constantly being reminded to me, you know, as a single mom. And right now, I think it is a, a big struggle to date because, okay, my son needs me. My son is a nonverbal child. He's a spitter. He's a, sometimes he's a pincher, a biter. He gets mm -hmm. physical. So with that being said, you can't bring him around everybody until you're comfortable enough. And I haven't been in that space yet, but, um, you know, me thinking for the future, I do think they have to understand, you know, these, what comes with it. Sometimes the behaviors change, the kid isn't going to automatically respond. So I think for for anybody dating and you have a child on the spectrum, we have to remember not everybody understands autism. Autism is fairly new mm -hmm. and it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult because they're not the typical child. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm not, I'm not able to like fully, you know, tell you about dating experiences, but I will say that I think I've received some type of sympathy or someone feeling sorry for me and what I have to deal with as a mother with a child with autism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I wanted to know how that process works because uh, for, for my wife and I, I mean, we struggle like to try to make sure that we have quality time together, date night all those different things. We got to make sure that we have a sitter in place, whether it's family. And like you said, someone to at least understand uh, autism, you know, that they just can't be with anyone. And that's another thing. When you're dating, you're leaving your child with someone you trust. When you're communicating with someone, getting to know someone, even with just your friends, you have to remember Hey, whoever my child is with has to understand my child or understand the things that my child is capable of, which, I mean, let me just give you a little briefing. Mm -hmm. He would get in the cabinet. He would get in the cabinet, go inside the cabinet. I don't know if it's because he does, he likes to feel safe and alone. He doesn't like loud noises. So I've encountered where he would just walk, he would just crawl in the cabinet and I'm like, what if someone's looking for, no one's going to look in a cabinet. No one's going to look down below. They're going to look outside. They're going to look in the bathrooms, under the beds. But my son would typically want to go in the cabinets. And I think that's very scary. He's a loper, which means he will open the door and leave. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't like the setting, he doesn't like the noise. Even if he doesn't like the smell of our environment, he will open the door and try to leave. He's left before when he was younger. And that was with me as his mom. Mm -hmm. So I'm very cautious with who he's allowed to be with. Like you said, a sitter. That sitter has to understand, okay, he's nonverbal, but you got to know that he's hungry at this time. Mm -hmm. How do I know he's hungry? I can tell because he's spinning in this direction. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's so strategic and it's so much that, that you have to deal with and, and know and pay attention to with our mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Because we had to get uh, the, the child proof locks on the, on our doors. Uh, Cause our youngest, he he's a runner and he's fast. Like <laughs> one time his aunt took him to a park and thought that she could just like walk with him. It didn't work like that. I mean, he was, I mean, he's fast. So, so we hold his hand whenever we take him anywhere, but from locking the doors uh, and he likes to, to be in tight spots. He likes to be in like, like you say, like the cabinet uh, or in a closet, you know, just these little confined spaces. I think he liked that pressure. And that pressure is so typical for children with autism. It's like a sensory input. So it's just like receiving a hug, just yeah. not from a human. So being in that tight space, the closet, even the laundry basket, I saw my son just sit in a laundry basket and I know it was closed in there. So I, I thought maybe it felt great in the cabinet. You can close it. No one sees you. Of course, he had his iPad at the time. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, I'm alone. So for me, it's just, I know, you know, this is this is his comfort. This is his safe space. But some people wouldn't know that. They wouldn't know he'll just run, you know. And that can be difficult for people to adjust to, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, we have uh, um, someone who commented. Thanks for uh, commenting. Uh, they said, my grandson was recently diagnosed as having autism, which is mild, and I'm still trying to stop thinking about his future. Life is hard. Uh, and adding this challenge is hard. I promise to walk through life with him. Um, so that was a comment. Thanks again for commenting. We uh, appreciate that. I hope this video helps you. This is uh, part three of our series. Uh, what are some common misconceptions about autism that you often encounter in your advocacy efforts? Um, 